Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar looking at the fungal threat, specifically antimicrobial resistance in the intensive care unit. So we'll um, we'll give people a couple more a couple more minutes to arrive before we start our talks. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our speakers, and I'll do that in a second. The reason why we chose to have a webinar on antimicrobial resistance, specifically looking at fungal disease, is because fungal disease has typically been neglected over the decades of fundamental biology and critical care research, uh, even though fungal diseases are responsible for one and a half million deaths a year, which is the same number as tuberculosis on an annual basis, three times as much as malaria. Um, and yet funding has been um, a, a, a across the fields um, a, a, a factor out in terms of um, uh, how well funded it's been. So my name is Hugh Gifford and I am an intensive care registrar from the east of Scotland, currently on an MRC funded um, MRS PhD programme at the Centre of Medical Mycology um, in the University of Exeter, and I'm studying uh, invasive candidiasis, specifically candida auris. Um, so two of the scientists that I've come across um, are Dr. Tihana Beechenich, who will be uh, introducing us to um, uh, antimicrobial resistance in Canada in the ICU. And uh, Dr. Beechenich is a reader and a consultant in infectious diseases at St. George's University in London, frequently dealing with um, invasive candida in the ICU. And she has been the chief, uh, chief investigator for both the ASPI flu study, looking at uh, aspergillus complicating influenza, um, that's been going on the last few years, and the Candy Res study, which is looking at um, how candida is uh, evolving and how we can mitigate uh, against its resistance to antifungals in ICUs. And that's currently recruiting at the moment. I'll let her tell you more about that. And our second speaker then is uh, Dr. Jane Usher, who has been one of the senior scientists and a BBSRC Discovery Fellow previously um, at the University of Exeter. And she's leading a group and she has been doing some outstanding and really exciting work into systems biology with a lot of experience working in other yeasts um, but currently focusing on candida glabrata which I'm sure some of you will be upset has been suggested to be re renamed Nicasiomyces glabrata um, but uh, her approach to the fundamental biology and how enormous and seemingly infinite uh, infinitely complex systems um, in eukaryotic cells can be drilled down into for us to be able to explain resistance and to target it is, is really exciting. And I'm particularly glad that at an ICU and at an intensive care society webinar, um, we're able to have the fundamental biological science uh, and the clinical research coming together. Um, and I believe that that is where we'll see uh, the power of research um, uh, have fruit. So, uh, don't forget to ask questions. There's a little question and answer button at the bottom um, and just post your questions in there and uh, we will get to them at the end once um, uh, Dr. Beechnich and Dr. Usher have spoken. So I think people have probably had enough time to arrive. Um, if you've just arrived and you're really lost as to what um, antimicrobial resistance in fungi is, there's actually a great review uh, by Gao and colleagues in Nature Communications just from this year called The Importance of Antimicrobial Resistance in Medical Mycology. I will now let uh, Dr. Beechnich start. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And if there's any problems or you can't hear me, just please pop a message into the chat. I'm just getting my presenter view sorted. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. This is a subject obviously close to my heart. As Hugh has said, I'm a consultant and clinical academic in infectious diseases at St George's University and Hospital in London. And I've been interested in invasive fungal infections for a long time. Um, I'm just going to start seeing as I'm assuming most people are intensive care clinicians listening to this just to whet your appetite with a case that I was involved with uh, back in uh, 2018. This was a 38 year old male with uh, multiple comorbidities, including diabetes, ischemic heart disease and renal failure. And on peritoneal dialysis, he was admitted at one of our sector hospitals with community acquired pneumonia, 
complicated, as you can see from this first chest X-ray with the right-sided empyema, which was initially treated with a chest strain, but was then transferred to the thoracic surgeons at my hospital, St. George's, for a VATS procedure, which unfortunately um, uh, was resulted in a non-inflating right lung, and he ended up on our uh, cardiothoracic intensive care unit for many weeks with this non-inflating lung. He then developed hyperosinophilia and was given high-dose steroids for this. Some of you might know, of course, that steroids are a great potentiator of fungal growth, as well as just broadly being immunosuppressive. He then developed ARDS and was transferred to St. Thomas's, our local ECMO centre, for um, consideration of ECMO, which he eventually did not need. However, whilst on intensive care at St. Thomas's, developed um, E. coli and later serratia bacteremia, so increasingly resistant organisms for which he had courses of meropenem. He then acquired colonization with a resistant candida called Candida auris at multiple body sites, as you'll see here, lines, axilla, and, and groin, so including his femoral line, which he, he had a vascath in at the time. You can see here that typically for Candida auris, which is a relatively new and emergent multidrug resistant Candida, these isolates are usually predictably resistant to fluconazole and are first line often sensitive to the other drugs, but have the capacity to develop resistance to both amphotericin as well as anid is anidular fungin, so a kinocandin. So his isolate was fluconazole resistant, but sensitive to the others. And he had three successive courses of empiric therapy with anidular fungin over the course of two months, after which he was repatriated to St. George's, where he remained colonized with Candida auris. Because this uh, fungus persists in the environment around the patient and is very difficult to eradicate and has led to notable ICU outbreaks, we immediately put this patient into a side room with PPE and various other infection control measures which have been shown to work in other outbreaks. And we also uh, instituted chlorine-based cleaning of the entire unit, even though we had only a single case, as well as speciated all the candida species, even colonizing flora from our ICU patients, and screened everyone. And we managed to avert any onward transmission. The patient himself then spiked a fever and had a blood culture from his femoral line, which showed a yeast. This was again identified this time as an invasive isolate, Candida auris, and uh, the observant of you will have noticed that the nidular fungin MIC has gone from an original sensitive to an intermediate range and then uh, still sensitive to amphotericin. So this is just um, a plot of the patient's CRP. You can see here a spike and a background of having had meropenem for all those bacteremias as well as an anesolid for VRE. This is typical of these patients who are often exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics before they get colonized with resistant candida. He then got started on meropenem empirically at the time and anidular fungin. When we got that MIC result, we doubled the dose of anidular fungin because of the intermediate range, added in flucytosine as a second drug. He defervesced and the CRP came down. He didn't have endocarditis, but interestingly remained candidemic for four successive days and grew. The line was taken out and he continued to be colonized despite later receiving also a second week of amphotericin B. He unfortunately then developed um, a ventilator associated pneumonia due to ser uh, serratia and died um, about two weeks later, although not directly from his Candida auris. So Candida auris, as I mentioned, is a new fungal superbug, which is particularly notable for its propensity to cause outbreaks on ICUs, as you'll see here in UK ICUs. And it's uh, difficult to eradicate chronic carriage. Um, and it's, as I mentioned, intrinsically multidrug resistant with some isolates also resistant to amphotericin and echinocandin. And essentially, these are the three classes we have available to treat candida, which is very concerning. And the first line treatment still remains an echinocandin.
So just to give you a, a background to candida species in general, candida, as you probably know, are commensals of the human gut and also of the skin and mucosa in hospitalized patients, particularly following exposure to broad spectrum antibiotics, as is common in ICU patients. As a result, it's the fourth most common cause of bloodstream infection and sepsis in ICU patients. One of the reasons why candida is so prevalent is also that they're great biofilm formers, i.e. they stick to plastic, including lines. And like with candida auris, in general, we use echinocandins as first-line treatment of invasive infection. This is just a diagram from um, a, um, a paper we published in Intensive Care Medicine, a review of invasive candidiasis in critical care, if you're interested in reading later. But just to show all the factors that contribute to the spectrum between candida colonization on the unit and then various barrier breaches and also host factors that then contribute to invasive infection, which can either be bloodstream infection, candidemia with possibility of hematogenous dissemination, which is why we infection doctors always tell you to get an echo and get an eye exam in these patients, as well as um, localized deep-seated infection, most commonly abdominal candidiasis for, uh, following abdominal surgery. So how, uh, what are the most common species of candid, causing candidemia in the UK? So this is Public Health England's latest data. You'll see that candida albicans remains the top cause with a, about 40 to 45 percent of candidemia. Uh, and then glabrata that Jane will tell you more about later, which is another fungus which has the propensity to become multi-drug resistant and is actually far more prevalent you'll see fortunately in the UK um, due to good stewardship than candida auris, which has not been a common cause of candidemia, thankfully. Although in some countries like South Africa and India, up to 50% of candidemias on ICU are now caused by this auris. And then the third one is candida paracelosis. And remember that certainly when we've audited at our centers and other London centers, about 50% of candidemias in hospitals do occur in ICU patients. As I mentioned, both European and American guidelines advocate in a kind of candin as first line treatment, followed by de-escalation to an azole, usually fluconazole, and treating for 14 days from the first negative blood culture, which is why we ask you uh, to do uh, a repeat culture at 48 to 72 hours. And also, as I mentioned already, some other investigations to detect any metastatic spread. So, of course, it's not always so straightforward as we know on the ICU ward round, as it, because a lot of antifungal prescribing is not just for patients who have proven infection like candidemia. Um, this is a, a very helpful, if you like, summary ladder of the different uh, types of prescribing in the hospital, and particularly in this case, the ICU, which can be either prophylaxis, for example, uh, abdominal surgery um, with candida colonization. Some of the patients go on fluconazole. You all know that there's empiric prescribing in those who are febrile with certain candida risk factors, and then also preemptive prescribing in those who've got certain biomarkers that come back as positive and maybe suggestive imaging. And then finally, targeted strategy. And um, this is often a dilemma that we have on the ward round. And broadly speaking, I don't know about your units, but we use a modification of some form of candida risk score to guide prescribing and direct it to those who most need it, because of course, we will therefore hopefully avert resistance emergence. And certainly for patients who are following abdominal surgery and septic and have um, a candida colonization index, that is um, uh, a two or three or more sites colonized with candida or 50% of those that, that isolates that were sent to the lab colonizing sites are colonized with candida then usually you would be advised to send off a beta d glucan and consider starting empiric therapy with an echinocandin, wait for the biomarker result, post-prescription review at five to seven days, 
and then either discontinue or continue in consultation with your microbiology colleagues. Now, we looked at how antifungals were prescribed um, in three hospitals in London, St. George's, Guy's and Tommy's and King's over a six month period pre-pandemic. And it won't surprise you that the vast majority of prescribing in ICU is in this empiric setting and targeted and prophylaxis are second and third. And you will see here that, again, it's, it's equally balanced between a dekinocandin and a fluconazole with amphotericin and mold activazoles um, more rarely being used. And overall, in this cohort of 217 patients, just over 6% received antifungals during the course of their ICU stay. And again, you know, this is just breaking down the uh, ultimately what um, the prescribing was directed at. So again, you won't be surprised to see invasive candidiasis being most common Proven indication prophylaxis was sometimes in hematology patients or sometimes for non-invasive disease, mucosal candidiasis like oral thrush. And then there was usually either a gastrointestinal focus or an unknown source for the empiric prescribing. And then the molds directed against suspected aspergillosis with only 23% of patients ending up with proven IFI and over half with no evidence of invasive fungal infection, indicating the need for tailored strategies and better antifungal stewardship. Now, of course, there are many factors to think about when you prescribe an antifungal in the ICU that I'm sure you will um, go through some of these things when you're discussing it with your, on your microbiology ward rounds including previous antifungal exposure, which of course might indicate more likelihood of resistance, colonization, any local outbreaks, what the site is, because you've got to think whether the drug is going to penetrate there, any concurrent medications that they might interact with, and any organ failures or supports that may affect your drug PK and the need for monitoring. So just moving on to candida resistance, and obviously all of these factors about prescribing tie into antifungal resistance, which is directly linked to antifungal use. This is just a, a summary timeline of antifungal drug development starting from the 50s. And you can see that invariably, a bit like with antibiotics, as different drug classes are launched, particularly following the 80s and 90s, when the widely used oral azoles became available, you start noticing reports of treatment failures, fluconazole resistance in candida, later on aspergillus resistant to itraconazole, and also with the launch of the echinocandin drug class, the most widely used now in the ICU in the 2000s. And as you saw, first line treatment some echinocandin resistant candida, and then later on in 2009, candida auris. So a worrying development, and recently the WHO has published its priority list of fungal pathogens, which do include both glabrata and auris because of their drug resistant potential. So uh, just in the last few minutes to tell you about my ongoing candy rare study, which is taking place um, in uh, four intensive care units, three in London and one in Liverpool. It's a prospective observational cohort study enrolling adult ICU patients who are at risk of candida. We then, um, uh, we, we have intensivist PIs and ICU research nurses each site consenting the patients. The patients have a baseline blood sample and some basic data collection followed by twice weekly swabs from mouth and perianal area, which are then cultured for candida, uh, which are then identified and have MIC testing done. And then there's a sub-study of if they develop invasive candidiasis, some more serial culture sa and, and sampling for antifungal PK. And we're looking at whether they develop uh, colonization or infection with resistant candida. And basically, the inclusion criteria, they have to be adult, currently on IV antibiotics, and one of a number of risk factors that you will know are associated with a greater risk of invasive fungal infection, 
and exclusion is if they're not expected to stay more than 48 hours. As I mentioned, they have this data collection and blood sampling and then twice weekly candida screening swab and we look at their antimicrobial use and we look at some basic demographic and clinical outcome data. So um, if they develop a bloodstream infection, they then have multiple sampling over the course of the first 72 hours. And if they have an abdominal drain or urine as a focus, we also collect those and we profile them. And we're trying to identify treatment response biomarkers that could be used in future clinical trials. So far, when we looked at our interim data after the first 142 patients had completed, we, we managed to roughly identify patients who were, remember from that audit we did, about 6% of ICU patients received antifungals, but in this more selected cohort, just under half, 44%, received at least one course of antibiotics. And as previously, echinocandins being the top prescribed, followed by azoles, followed by oral nystatin. Um, just to give you a snapshot of the species we're seeing, this is, remember, this is mouth and perianal. Interestingly, of this cohort, about three quarters are colonized at any stage. And you will see here that, again, albicans is top, a bit like candidemia is in the UK, glabrata around 21%, and then some of the other species, note there is no auris, and parasilosis is relatively uncommon, possibly because that doesn't tend to colonize the gut so much as the skin. But less susceptible candida species were prevalent in 39% of patients. So certainly something to watch for, because we know patients do develop invasive infection from their own colonizing flora. So finally, the research questions we are um, hoping to ask from this study, which we're hoping to enroll 400 patients and we may extend the study subject to further funding, is how does being exposed to antifungals on the unit, including time-dependent days of exposure and which drug relate to resistance emergence, both by comparing the proportion of resistant isolates and a change in MIC from first to last isolate, and secondly, in the patients with candidemia, can we describe the relationship between antifungal exposure or the PK and the microbiologic clearance of infection? And if we can, these would be really helpful treatment response biomarkers to use in future planned clinical trials. If you are listening and you're interested in joining us as a site, um, do get in touch with me on this email. Otherwise, thank you for listening and happy to take questions at the end. And I will hand over to my um, colleague, Jane Usher, to tell you about some of the amazing science she has been doing on Candida glabrata. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Johanna. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Brilliant. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you uh, today. And as has been mentioned a few times, I primarily work on Candida glabrata. Um, to just give you a little bit of a background of where I've been and how I ended up here. Um, I did my studies in um, Trinity College in Dublin, looking at the genome organization of the um, lager yeast, um, where I learned one of my first essential life skills, which is brewing. Um, then I uh, relocated to the Ottawa Institute of Systems Biology, where I worked on the production of yeast strains for biofuel production. And this is where I really got into systems biology and the power of yeast genetics. And then from 2011 onwards, I have entered the world of fungal pathogens um, at the University of Exeter. And in 2022, I became a BBSRC Discovery Fellow. So why Candida glabrata? Um, it's recognized by the CDC as a serious threat due to its drug resistance profiles. Um, as Tihana has mentioned, it is the second most common cause of Candida infection. Um, it is also not sitting within the CTG clade, which is where a lot of the other Candidas that have been mentioned are, which is here. Candida glabrata is more closely um, related to the Saccharomyces yeasts. Um, and also important for me and for my work is that 
its genome is very poorly annotated to date, so we don't actually know a lot of these underlying genes and pathways involved in drug resistance and its adaptation to these stress conditions. So at the moment, just about 10% of its genome is very well characterized. That leaves another 90% to be teased apart and hopefully enough to keep me in a career for a few more decades. So I use um, an evolution of approaches to study Candida gabbrata. So this is the ca Candida gene approach using then also unbiased screens. So this is filtering back into systems biology. Um, synthetic genetic interactions, so the interplay between genes under different conditions. And then also learning from and mimicking the power of yeast, and that's inferring a lot of information from really well studied model yeasts, such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, so one way that I've been able to use this and to link into antifungal drug resistance is to try to attenuate the emergence of antifungal drug resistance by harnessing synthetic lethal interactions. So as we all know, drug resistance is a massive problem, but one thing that is um, hindering our development of novel therapeutics is um, the increased toxicity of new drugs, off-targets effect, and also then the uh, emergence of resistance. So to date, most of our knowledge is based on the drug mode of action or the potential mechanisms of reaction. But this is quite a narrow way to approach this topic and can also constrain the number of proteins that we can target. Um, so looking at azol resistance, the main transcription factor involved in developing azol resistance is PDR1, and it can affect the expression of other genes such as PDR5, SNQ2, and CDR1, which are all involved in um, pumping drugs in and out of the cells. And these PDR1 mutants can also present as petite mutants, so they also then take a longer time to grow, so they're not also always seen on the first pass of looking at a plate. So PDR1 is my favorite transcription factor. Um, to, so to just briefly give you a snippet of information about it, the gene is divided up into four main domains, a DNA binding domain, an inhibitory domain, um, a middle homology region, and an activation domain. So these little black and gray dashes along here are point mutations that have all been previously characterized in PDR1 from uh, clinical isolates where the patient has had an increased level of resistance to azole. So what I want to look at is how are these point mutations or gain of function mutation able to allow for adaptation and resistance to azoles? And if we can then also target the genes that interact with these unique gain of function PDR1 mutations. So my hypothesis is that by targeting the synthetic lethal interacting partners of our gain of function PDR1 alleles, it's giving us an alternative preventative option with respect to the emergence of fluconazole resistance. So to do this, I first characterized the uh, genetic interaction partners of some PDR1 alleles. Um, and this involves doing large scale unbiased genetic interaction screens. So we take our different PDR1 genes and we overexpress them and then we mate them against knockout collections. And then we're able to determine on the fitness of these growth colonies, their interaction profiles. And one way then that we can represent this data is um, through these genetic interaction maps, or as some people refer to them as radiculomes, because you really have to focus in on what you're looking at. But just um, at a high level, each one of these red circles here represents a different gain of function PDR1 mutation that we have screened. This here is our wild type, so no gain of function mutation, so from a lab strain. This one is from an L280F gain of function mutation. So this one has um, a strain that has a very high level of drug resistance. And interestingly, I honed in on its synthetic lethal interaction with GCN5. So then I took four more point um, gain of function mutation strains, did a tailored screen using these interacting partners. And again, I was able to see that all of these PDR1 point mutations genetically interact with GCN5. 
So I wanted to then see if the deletion or the chemical inhibition of GCN5 results in a synthetic lethal phenotype in PDR1. So everything you do on a high throughput screen, it's always just really good to recapitulate it at a single level. So we made a titratable promoter. So we have our PDR1 gain of function, and then we're able to switch on and off the expression of GCN5. And again, we can see that this is a lethal interaction between the two genes. So then doing some deep diving online, we we're able to see that there is a chemical inhibitor available on the market for GCN5. So it's gamma butyl acetone here. Um, and a very quick screen to see if this is a worthwhile kind of follow up experiment is to take a collection of clinical isolates that I have that I've sequenced and know have a PDR1 gain of function mutation, grow them on normal media on the top panel here and then grow them on media that's been supplemented with two millimolars of our GCN5 chemical inhibitor. And we're able to see that this will prevent growth of our different gluconazole resistant clinical strains. So this was showing that it's a really strong genetic interaction between GCN5 and PDR1 gain of function mutants. So next I wanted to see if deleting the synthetic lethal genes or chemical in inhibition of them can reduce the emergence of fluconazole resistance in candida glabrata. So this involves setting up possibly one of my least popular experiments in the lab. So for each strain that I'm going to look at, so I have a wild type, a GCN5 null, and then a GCN5 where I'm chemically inhibiting it. I drew this experiment in triplicate. So I have 10 cultures with my different strains um, all with media supplemented with fluconazole, increasing levels across the flasks. At the first flask where I start to see inhibition of growth, I use this as my starter culture for my next round of drug exposure. I go through 10 cycles of this. So we're really drilling down into this um, evolution and adaptation to drug exposure in these cells. Then the surviving populations, we phenotypically screen them. So we look at their growth fitness profiles. And then we also sequence them to try to see if we were getting mutations in our PDR1 allele. So the hypothesis from this experiment was that fluconazole resistance should emerge at a much more reduced rate and to a lower level in our strains that have synthetic lethal genes deleted or chemically inhibited compared to my wild type candida glabrata. So just looking at the sequence data of PDR1 in our wild type in the top panel here, we could see after just two rounds of increasing fluconazole exposure, we're starting to see gain of function point mutations in PDR1 emerge over time. Whereas in our GCN5 deletion strain and the one where we have it chemically inhibited, we get up to six to seven rounds of exposure to increasing levels of fluconazole resistance before we started to see our first gain of function point mutation in our PDR1. And what was really interesting about looking at this emergence of resistance is what they is that they emerge in a very ordered manner across our PDR1 transcription factor, with all of the first point mutations that I identified arising in the activation domain of um, our gene. So the candida glabrata strains with the PDR1 mutations exhibit an increased level of virulence. The rate of evolution of resistance to antifungal, antifungals can be directly linked to the ability of candida glabrata to cause disease. So through blocking our candida glabrata PDR1 gain of function mutations, this then represents a new and novel way of reducing the emergence of fluconazole resistance in a population. Um, so it's also highlighting the dynamicism of the cell. So just looking at one gene in isolation is not necessarily giving us the full story of what is involved in drug resistance. So this leads me on to um, the work that I'm undertaking as part of my discovery fellowship, and that is looking at com combating combinatorial stress resistance. So within the host, the candida glabrata cells are exposed to multiple different stresses. And these include oxidative stress, osmotic stress, temperature stress, drug exposure, and evasion and exposure to host immune cells. 
classically, these have all been looked at singly and we're able to get really lovely profiling data, but this is not a true representation of what is happening in the host. The cells are bombarded with these stresses in combination. So I want to look at these in combination to try to break down this complexity. So to be able to break the complexity of stress resistance, I'm taking a multi-pronged approach. So Candida glabrata is haploid in its genome makeup, and it has also so far been characterized as asexual. So this makes doing forward genetic screening um, very problematic. So I've spent the last uh, six years engineering this strain to be able to have a functional sexual cycle. So this then opens up the amount of forward genetic studies that we are able to do and really increases the power of the molecular toolbox that we have to study these fungal pathogens. So taking my engineered strains, I've been able to develop um, a library of progeny, all with different phenotypes. So they get characteristics from both parents. And then using bulk segregant analysis genome sequencing. So this is where you sequence um, progeny that have similar characteristics together to identify genes that play a role in the mutation. We're also doing long-term RNA-seq studies in the presence and absence of stress and stress in combination to look at how the cells are adapt adapting to these stress over time, because a lot of our previous studies only look at the initial burst of gene adaptation to stress. But what I want to see is how these cells are actually able to rewire their networks in the presence of stress. And then to be able to functionally annotate these genes, as I've previously mentioned, only 10% of our genome is actually annotated so far. I use, a different, I use a tapestry of different tools that are available to me in the lab. We've got genetic interactions, which I've talked about in my PDR1 example, phenotypic screening, the um, immune cell response, as Candida gabrata is very, very capable of evading the host immune cell and will actually grow quite happily in macrophages. And then to scale this up to a whole organism level to actually try to see what exactly is going on at a global level. So um, bulk segregant analysis screening has been used to identify non mutations related to stress. So what this involves is taking um, a lab strain or an inferior parent and you mate this against a superior or in my case, these are clinical isolates or strains that are resistant to um, different stresses and that includes drugs. We mate these and then we get um, our segregants, all which have gone through meiosis and show different um, genomic um, makeups of traits from both parental strains. Then strains that have similar um, phenotypes are then sequenced and then the sequencing data is then analyzed to be able to uh, pinpoint the genes related to each stress condition. So this uh, interaction map here is a very zoomed out version of what I've done so far. So each colored dot represents a different combinatorial stress condition. So these include looking at many of the different drugs that are used in a clinical session, um, setting, and then also oxidative and osmotic stresses. So we apply these in um, single, in combination and then also in sequential manner to see how these cells are able to adapt because we know in combination you will get one very clear pattern but what happens if to try to make it more representative of a clinical setting we have cells recovered from a macrophage then exposed to one drug then exposed to another drug and then we sequence them how are these profiles going to be different so to just uh, hone in on one example of that um, we have oxidative stress, which um, is induced using TBU, which is a chemical that we use in the lab, and obviously then the azole fluconazole. And from our preliminary bulk segment analysis sequencing, we've been able to identify a common set of genes that are involved in the resistance of both of these stress conditions. Um, and these genes are all being uh, fully characterized in the lab at the moment, um, and just kind of the most preliminary data is that we can see that uh, hex, HXT6, which is a hexose transporter gene involved in sugar metabolisms, 
when we overexpress this gene, we can see that we're getting hypervirulent strains in our animal model in the lab. These genes down here in gray are Candida glabrata specific genes. So these ones are very specific just to Candida glabrata. They're not in other Candida genomes. And these may hold the key to why this uh, fungal pathogen is so able to adapt and evade the immune system and also really rapidly um, develop drug resistance in a clinical setting. So um, within the host, it's a very um, carefully balanced um, role between adaptation and the fitness of the yeast cell. So we have our yeast cells, which are then adapting to antifungals, which are also then being impacted by our host fitness. But if we then start to add in extra layers of stress, our cells are going to have to go through an adaptation response to be able to circumvent uh, the host defenses. So we want to then also see what are the fitness costs to antifungal and stress adaptation. So what impact is this having on the yeast cell? Um, and don't so much delve into the host fitness as we have heard, um, we know that the host is going to be sick. So my focus is more on what is happening to the candida glabrata cells and how they are able to adapt and rewire themselves to be able to evade the immune system. Um, and what we can see from our initial looking at long-term exposure to fluconazole in our candida glabrata cells is that stress and metabolic rewiring is very evident as the cells are adapting to the continuous bombardment of azoles. So we have 355 genes that are down-regulated and 212 genes that are up-regulated. And out of these uh, down-regulated genes, 14 of these are up to eight-fold down-regulated, which is a really massive change from what is normally the baseline. And these involve genes um, that have roles in ribosome biogenesis, RNA processing, and oxidative and pH stress response. What we can see is that a lot of our genes, they may be classically assigned one stress response, but you actually get cross tolerance between the two. So resistance pathways, they're not just straight lines, they're more zigzag and circles and all very interlinked. So why should you care? Well, the next steps in my work is to be able to link up the bulk segregant analysis sequencing, the RNA-seq data and the functional annotation to build these interactive maps to see how one single gene or a pathway is involved in the adaptation and the evolution of stress and drug responses and how this interplay between these genes in the dynamic cell is able to result in the seeding of disease. So if we can work backwards from the disease back through to the yeast cell, and then be able to pinpoint these specific genes, it opens up our different avenues for combinatorial um, treatments, but then also different new novel drug targets that we could then potentially start to tease apart. Um, so I'm going to just now finish up with my acknowledgements because there's a huge amount of people who help me with all of this work. Um, my current mentors down here in the MRC Centre for Medical Mycology in Exeter are Professor Neil Gow and Professor Al Brown. And then also um, I'd to thank Dominique Sanglard, uh, Stephanie Deitzman and Adele Highland and Delma Childers who have given me access to their clinical isolates and the BBSRC who are funding my research at the moment. And also a call out to any of the clinicians. Um, if you come across really exciting Candida Glabrata clinical isolates in the clinic, I am always happy to receive them and to do some fun genetic work with them. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. So I've got a few questions for you and we've got about 10 minutes um, before we wrap up. So the first question I'd like to ask is, um, is probably the, the biggest question. And that would be, obviously, there's the Candy Res study shows that we can take um, samples from patients and there's a huge amount that we can learn from looking at the changes in candida species in individuals and when we have our candida in the lab um, and we're able to look at the, the transcriptome and how different pathways are interacting with each other 
um, then we're able to, to start to build up the picture that we need to understand, uh, understand antifungal resistance. So if you had all the money that you could possibly want, then what do you see as being the next step in research for how we can move the field forward? especially thinking about the, uh, the, the, the antifungal resistance in the ICU. Is this to me or to both of us, Hugh? De definitely to both of you. Okay. Uh, Jane, do you want to start and I'll go second? Sure. I, mean, if... <laughs> um, I think one of the things as a fundamental bio biologist and genetic geneticist in the lab is to have better links with clinicians to be able to get our hands on these um, clinical isolates before they have become a clonal population. So when they've been freshly swabbed from a patient. Um, to have more high throughput mechanisms to get sequencing analysis done and out there, but also to make that more accessible to people who don't have bioinformatics background to be really easily able to see these are your genes that are mutated. These are the ones that might be interesting. Um, I guess I really am biased and I think that looking at things at a system level um, and high throughputedness are really important and they're areas in the medical mycology field that I think we're slightly lacking compared to other um, fungal research. Great. How about you, Dr. Beechnich? So, well, obviously, one of the reasons we're doing the, the Candy Res study is to address this question. And when Jane says she needs, you know, clinical isolates collected from swabs from patients, and particularly we need well-characterized clinical populations, which is what we're aiming to have in the CandyRes study. We've been enrolled and systematically, we know exactly which antifungal drug they've been exposed to. And as Jane says, one of the critical things that we don't often see if we just collect isolates from a microbiology lab is that these have been so-called passage. Some of these resistance mechanisms are lost very quickly. Um, others are mutation based and are not. So we need to try to collect these as close as possible to the patient as we can. And in fact, through the Candy Res study, we're planning to um, try to do some direct uh, culturing of the swabs from the patient, including on the fungal media to pick up um, some uh, resistant subpopulations, which can often as Jane says, the fungi adapt to the antifungals in real time. And sometimes the MIC, which we're finding, doesn't always change between the first and the last isolate. But actually, we're finding if you streak the isolates on drug, you see these subpopulations. And I'm very interested that you mentioned the petite mutants, Jane, because we've been say, seeing these really tiny little pinpoint colonies when we grow the isolates on fluconazole. So what is the approach if we had a lot of money? Well, we are currently writing a grant together with colleagues at Exeter University where we're trying to link up our collection, you know, curation of this large biobank of our carefully collected isolates, some of which will then be sent to Exeter and profiled through Jane and other, you know, high throughput ways of testing combinations of both existing and maybe some drugs which show which target different pathways that target resistance and equally what we need is really funding for good animal model experiments something we can't do in humans um, uh, which we are you know to look at the effect of the antifungal dose and how you know the fungus is cleared so we'll certainly be going to be asking the MRC for money to support this. And we really think as clinicians here at St. George's that the future is to combating antifungal resistance is a combination approach. So not using single drugs, just echinocandins alone, but maybe using antifungals in combination to preserve our limited um, uh, classes of antifungals that we have. Thank you so much.
OK, so I've got a, a very clinical question for for you, Tihana, about um, whether or not an, an echo and an eye exam are really necessary when we when we discover a, a bloodstream candida infection. Well, um, uh, as you know, particularly when it comes to eye exams, there's controversy between um, the Infectious Disease Society guidelines and perhaps uh, Ophthalmology Society guidelines, where the one says certainly an echo and an eye exam is advocated for all in all Infectious Disease Society guidelines simply because of the potential, as you know, catastrophic consequences of missing these, albeit rare events. Um, uh, whether they're absolutely necessary, well, I think on, on an ICE, in an ICU setting, obviously with a patient that's ventilated and unconscious and where it's difficult to ask for the presence of floaters or any visual defects, I would argue that, yes, um, it is necessary, and certainly that's what we recommend. But I'd be very interested to hear the intensivist perspective on this. Uh, it, the key is also not to do it too early, certainly for an eye exam. So usually in uh, a week or two after the candidemia, because things may be missed. But do you have a view of it as an ICU trainee? I think it's, uh, it's examining the back of an eye is very cheap and uh, so should be should be something that's well within the remit of, of bedside clinicians, especially in patients who are, as you say, um, un unconscious. Um, but that's really interesting that um, thinking about eye exam follow up um, in the weeks uh, after the detection of candidemia, that's not something I'd, I'd really thought about. Um, but that sounds that sounds really useful. So um, the uh, and I suppose the challenge with an echo is um, you know, echoes are increasingly done by clinicians, clinicians, clinicians at the clinicians at the bedside. But looking for a true vegetation's exclusion would need a more invasive procedure like a like like a transesophageal echo. Um, yeah. So, I have a, I have a question for 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 Dr. Asher, and that is that um, can you tell us a little bit more about PDR one, your favourite transcription factor? You know, what what's what's the picture here? You know, how many different genes uh, and uh, and conditions are in influencing what PDR one does and how it's changed? Maybe how the gene is chopped up or anything like that, and how many genes is is PDR one going on to influence? And I'm assuming from your talk that it it's controlling, it's a master controller of these um, drug transporters that are kicking azoles and other things out of out of glabrata cells. Oh my god, that's like a textbook you want. <laughs> um, so PDR1 um, plays a role in um, interacting with the ergosterol gene, so that is the efflux pumps that pump the drugs in and out of the cells. Um, it will also upregulate um, SNQ2, CDR1. So these are all other genes that are involved in um, shuttling the genes into the cell. But one of the um, important things as well to note is that we don't actually know the real mechanisms of how the drugs are getting into the cell in Candida vibrata either. Um, as for it being my favorite transcription factor, I think it's because the collection of isolates that I have that all have different um, point mutations in it that are giving me different levels of resistance and susceptibility is really interesting. So you're able to just profile these, get a really different dynamic um, pattern of how they're behaving in the cells. Each gain of function mutation that we've looked at so far have a core set of genes that they genetically interact with. But depending on where they sit on the scale of whether they're involved in super drug resistance or more down into susceptibility, then that's where the really fine differences of what they interact with comes into play. So it's trying to then build a map of targeting the other, because no, because a transcription factor can speak to another transcription factor. So if we can find parallel pathways that it's involved in, then that can make it a really nice target for a combinatorial um, intervention. Yep. Thank you. The, I've I've uh, one last. Well, I think I've just got one last question um, for you, Jane. And that's um, I, I, this may also be for you, Tiana. But um, um, the que the question is whether there's evidence that the mutations you're identifying in the lab are the kind of mutations that are present in patients and and in the clinics. Yeah. 
uh, is this relating to PDR1 mutations? So these um, those mutations have all come initially from clinical isolates that we've sequenced. Um, we have found maybe three or four ones that have arisen during for forced evolution experiments in the lab that have not been identified in any of the published clinical isolates that we've seen the mutations in. Um, but then at a larger genome wide scale, um, we do see different mutations arise in the lab versus yeah. in the host, but that's due to the fact um, that in the host, you're bombarded with multiple stresses compared to in the lab, we're really able to tailor the conditions that we're stressing the cells out to. Um, but that is getting better, we're able to develop um, kind of smarter ways of working around that and to able to recover also samples that have been through different animal models and through um, immune cells as well for our studies. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, right, so for either of you, before we wrap, we wrap up, is there any, any other comments you want to make or anything else you want to say? I just wanted to ask Jane, Jane, you saw that echinocandins are obviously now first line therapy and especially for glabrata because of its known fluconazole resistant. Are you planning on looking at echinocandins in your combinatorial uh, stress experiments? Yes, it has been included in it, yeah. Um, so we look at uh, the echinocandins with oxidative osmotic stresses and then the interplay between echinocandins and other drugs as well. So we've included echinocandins, azoles, AMP, and five excellent great well um on behalf of all of the attendees um all the the dozens and dozens and dozens of people who have signed up and on behalf of um all those in the future of um intensive care clinicians and patients who will benefit from the research you're doing thank you so much for your talks today um and this should be on youtube so um we can send it to family and friends uh, so they can watch it again on replay um, and we will say thank you very much and goodbye have a lovely day everyone